Okay, Phyllis, thank you. Uh, I'm having audio difficulties, so I'm sure that was a lovely introduction, but I can't hear anything. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I wanted to just start by saying um, thank you very much for letting me share the exciting work that we've been doing here at the Reese Museum to showcase the story of suffrage in Southern Appalachia. And we have found out all kinds of exciting details about the women in this area that were previously unknown. A lot of this story has never been told before. Um, and I kind of just want to start out by talking about the community aspects of the story. So the reason that this exhibit um, came into being is because I joined a community group of people who were interested in this history. And that started us off down this road of searching through uh, newspapers from the early 1900s through the ratification process in the 1920s. And we started piecing together um, this really amazing network of women who were connected nationally, if not internationally, to wider organizations that then brought their organizational skills into the region. Um, and so we're focusing very regionally um, and trying to tell the story through the collections that the museum holds and then through um, the personal experiences of a few of the uh, suffrage activists in the area. And I'm sorry, I just have to say I'm very nervous. I've not ever done a Zoom um, presentation of this sort before, so I hope you will forgive me. <laughs> to get into this scene. I normally really love these types of gallery talks because it gives me a chance to communicate with you. So normally um, we would host you in the space and I would be able to walk you through everything and we would discuss things and talk back and forth. And I want to make sure we have the opportunity to talk a bit at the end. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of focus on the highlights and, and introduce the exhibit to you without getting too bogged down into details because it, it does represent an entire year of research. So there's a lot of information. Um, and I just want to give you um, a, a good overview of how the exhibit was developed and kind of some of the main themes um, that we're looking at in the exhibit. And I suppose I will start that out by um, talking a little bit about how I feel personally connected to this. Um, exhibit because um, I spend a lot of time living outside of the region and um, I discovered in my time away from home that uh, people really don't know a lot about this area and they're very interested in it and I um, went back and got a master's in Appalachian studies because I also was interested in it and I discovered I really didn't know very much about my own personal history and my own culture and in particular, I've always been fascinated with my grandmother's story. Um, she was born in Embryville in 1909, um, which is the horseshoe bend in the Nolichucky River, um, also called Bumpus Cove, and it became famous later for environmental degradation. But she was born there in 1909. She was one of 13 children. Her parents were, um, they didn't read and write. They were, her father was a sharecropper. Uh, but despite all this, she went to high school. She went to a boarding school called Washington College Academy uh, and graduated from high school. And then she went on to come here to ETSU. And I actually have a photo. I'm going to attempt to share my screen with you. I have a photo of her um, from the yearbook called The Chalk Line. Get to it here. Okay, so this is her in the center, this lovely profile. Her name was Margaret Hicks, and she graduated in 1933. She was a double major in home economics and English. Um, so <clears throat> um, I couldn't figure out when I was um, younger how she came to have this education and then go on to have this long career in teaching um, coming from the place that she did. Uh, but through the research that I was doing um, as part of this exhibit work, I started looking into some of the, um, uh, some of the, um, sorry, I'm distracted by the chat. <laughs> some of the organizational work that the women were doing outside of political organizing because they were also very, very interested in social justice issues. And some of the ways that they organized or some of the um, topics that they organized around had to do with literacy and education. And so 
Come to find out that my grandmother's life was a direct result of some of the work that these women did, meaning that my life is a direct result of some of the work that these women did. So um, to me, this exhibit is a very personal story because um, I really resonate with that, with that particular part of the history. So um, I'm giving you the view of the exhibit. This is what you would see when you come into the front door here. And at the beginning, at the entrance, uh, we have a quilt banner, um, and then we have a proclamation made by Mayor Jenny Brock to recognize the importance and the historic importance of the centennial celebration of this year. And then as you come in, the idea is that you would enter into the, a more kind of internal view of what these women may have experienced. So this part of the exhibit is um, a recreation of a living room, which was actually a new term that wasn't um, kind of launched into popular culture until about 1920. And then um, to the right over here is an Edwardian morning room. So this represents a very transitional phase in history. Of course, we had World War I and all of the social unrest happening that led to all these uh, major changes in how people experience their lives at this time. And in fact, the term living room um, came about as a direct result of the influenza pandemic of 1918. And on the, the morning room desk, and this is a, um, this is a reproduction, so I'm allowed to touch it, but we partnered with the Tennessee State Museum to get some documents from the women who participated in these events. And this is a letter sent to Eliza Shout White by someone who is writing to congratulate her um, on uh, becoming uh, a major organizer in the area. And she says, I wanted to write you weeks ago, but I've been down with, this, with the influenza for the last five weeks. So um, the overlap between historical events of that time and now, I mean, just can't be understated or overstated. So in the living room area, um, this would have historically been called the sitting room or the drawing room. And when people died at this time, they were kind of placed in state in the family home, often in this room, and people would um, participate in mourning activities, often for three or four days before the funeral could be held. And so because the Spanish influenza, um, that pandemic was so bad, so many people lost their lives that it started to be called the death room. And so then after uh, that time period, they uh, laid the ladies home journal there was an article in the Ladies Home Journal that said that, um, you know, it's time to start living again. And that launched, we should call this the living room, and that kind of launched that term into uh, popular culture. And then the room was really designed to host events. So these women were hosting teas. Um, there were all kinds of formal occasions and informal occasions that would have been held in the sitting room area. And uh, we used a lot of artifacts from the Harris family collection. The Harris family moved to Johnson City in the late 1800s as part of the industrial boom time. Um, he was involved in the lumber business, as were many of the husbands of the women who participated in suffrage activities. And um, they donated a large amount of uh, furniture and household goods uh, to the museum in the 90s. Um, I also found a lot of connection with sewing. So I have a lot of artifacts that have to do with needlework and handicrafts. Um, included throughout the exhibit uh, because that would have been an important way to um, express the ideals of the suffrage movement. And I have some more information about that uh, a little bit later. And then the room is styled after the Blue Mountain Room, which was a home uh, in the uh, White House. It was developed in 1913 by uh, uh, the Wilson um, presidency and it featured handicrafts and weaving and different things from well, women, particularly in uh, Western North Carolina. And so I have some photographs to sort of compare um, that, uh, that style of work to what we have out here. Uh, and the, the craftsman style became really popular during this time as a response to the Industrial Revolution. So this became a way to feature handmade items as opposed to um, things made in factories because uh, social working conditions was a real concern for a lot of these women who were organizing. All right, I'm going to roll you around here. It's sort of like 
the uh, makes me think of the Saturday Night Live sketch where he rides the podium through the streets. <laughs> okay, so from the interior, you know, the personal lives of these women, I'm transitioning here into social organizations and also the way that they developed their look as a form of propaganda. So uh, these women were extremely savvy about how they looked in public and the types of um, colors, the way that they dress, the way that they portrayed themselves in public. Um, from the very top of the organization, they were instructed to always look the part of a really proper Edwardian lady so that when they were participating in direct action and when they were doing things that could be deemed as masculine, they would look the part, they would look very proper and it would be a little bit easier to maybe reclaim that narrative and uh, change the way they were being portrayed in the media because that was a real issue. You know, um, suffragettes in England were a bit more militaristic than women seemed to be in this area and they had gained a reputation for um, being very violent, you know, smashing windows and um, tangling with law enforcement and things like that. And so the ladies in Johnson City, the ones that we have represented here, um, were, um, they were not about that. They were, they were much more um, looking to um, touch base with people who would understand them as, you know, very feminine and proper and socially acceptable women. And, and that's the way that they manipulated um, the system that they were a part of at the time. Um, so in this section, I'm um, really focusing on the way that they used colors and banners. Again, there was a lot of sewing involved. So all these um, material artifacts that you see would be handmade. Um, the banner in the middle is one that we recreated. That's on display at the Tennessee State Museum, but material culture that's directly related to the suffrage movement is hard to come by. There is not a lot of it. So some of the things that you see, um, we recreated. The sashes come from the temperance movement. Um, they were worn by Jesse Ackerman and um, the uh, suffrage ladies sort of took their cue from the temperance movement as far as wearing um, what they would call regalia, so sashes and bright colors and things like that. Um, I'm very into living history and costuming. So my background is in performance arts before I got started uh, in museum work. And so I call her Mildred and she is styled after Mildred Smith whose um, photo album we have in the collection here at the museum and who is featured in the mural that I'm going to show you next. And this outfit is really um, dated to the early 1900s. It's much more Edwardian than it is, you know, early 1920s. And the, the skirt that she's wearing there um, is convertible. It has two hooks in the back so she could put a bustle in if she was wearing it in the 1880s or then she could remake it and use it um, for more modern silhouettes, which this is a very Edwardian look. And I'm um, really interested in the um, foundational garments that they would wear. So I just wanna show you um, what she has on under here because it's fascinating. So Mildred is wearing a, um, this was called a bust enhancer. This one was made in Paris in 1905. And then she has on all of these layers. So under the corset, she's wearing the chemise. And then on top of that, she has the corset cover. And then the slip that she's wearing, um, this would have been a time when they traded from petticoats to slips. So the slip that she's wearing is made of rayon, which would have been a really new fabric. So this outfit is, um, it's, it's really, it's a mix of old and new for the time period. And the corset cover, which is the white cotton that she's wearing over um, in this picture, was a pattern from the ETSU Normal School Home Ec program. So one of the skills that the Home Ec program here at the university would have been teaching would have been a lot of sewing. So, and then she also has lace-up boots instead of button boots. So she's a, she's a very modern lady. So now we're going to go over here towards the mural and this detail that we have around the doors we took from a, a photo um, photo frame out of the collection. 
um, and reproduced it throughout on text panels and in details on the walls there. So the mural here was painted by Ellen Elms, um, who's a local muralist from Southwest Virginia. And this is being installed in downtown Johnson City. Um, and it'll be revealed in October. And hopefully you'll see some news about that and be able to uh, participate in some of those events if you would like to. Um, and the part of the mural that we have exhibited here is just one detail is much larger than this and tells a much bigger story. But we have, um, we have put up the parade portion and this represents um, an event that was held in Johnson City in October of 1916 when um, one of the leading suffragettes in the area um, on the horse there, Eliza Shout White, led a parade full of women in automobiles and also the Fife and Drum Corps from the Soldiers Home um, through the streets of Johnson City in support of suffrage. And the imagery that is used in this mural um, has a lot of historic connections. The lady on the horse team um, was, was big in history. And in the suffrage movement, in a lot of um, instances, it's really all about Joan of Arc. And um, according to the Suffragette, which was a publication put out by the English branch uh, of the suffrage organizations, um, she was the ultimate kind of feminine icon. She was a warrior. She was um, pure and proper, but also um, very hardcore. And so they sort of used her um, as shorthand for what they felt like a suffrage should be in public, especially. And I just found it really interesting that one of the um, main images that's come out of the recent protests is a woman on a horse. So um, we find that this, this imagery still is very resonant for most people, you know, if you can't, and she said the lady on the horse here was quoted as saying, nobody can ignore a woman on a horse, right? So <laughs> this was a, um, this was a method of protest that was used uh, throughout the world. It started in England with uh, the first example in about 1911, then it was in Washington, D.C. in 1913, and then right here in Johnson City in 1916. So a very effective uh, method. And I'm just gonna turn you this way because it's kind of a long walk. But one of the um, interesting connections that we found was to the soldier's home. So the soldier's home was built in 1903 um, as a place for uh, union veterans to come. So um, once the Civil War was over, Northern women in particular noticed that a lot of soldiers were dying in the streets. They were just being released from the army and they didn't have care. And so um, the women um, created groups that lobbied at the White House and whatnot, and um, soldiers' homes were established across the country. And Johnson City got actually one of the nicest ones. There were some write-ups and publications at the time suggesting that it was too rural here, and it was too big of an investment for such a rural place. Um, but the government spent $3 million in 1903 um, on the soldier's home. And I did some digging trying to find out how much money that is right now, and, and it's a lot. So it was a really expensive um, building. And it supported uh, 250 acres of farmland, dairy cattle, um, poultry. They fed 2,500 people um, daily off of what they grew there. So it was a major operation. And it was really focused on, on the living situation of the people. And so these people kind of became part of the community here in Johnson City. During World War I, they were encouraged to move off campus and into the community um, because of all the people returning from World War I that needed medical services. So there was a very large population of Union supporters um, in, in East Tennessee uh, because of all that history. And um, it's pretty well documented that a lot of the um, suffrage organizations had their start in the abolitionist movement. So it makes a lot of sense that um, this area was a um, major hub of organization towards equality for um, all, in, in all kinds of different ways. And there were several families who were really a part of this um, movement. Uh, one of them, was the Divine family, and that's Paul Divine's uniform in the corner there, the Milburn family, and the Lyle family, and they are all featured in this mural um, in one way or another. 
And then one of the things that the mural really goes into is uh, the racial divides that were still in existence during this time. So really when the 19th Amendment was passed, uh, it mainly just affected uh, white people. You know, basically white women were allowed to vote, but it was many, many years until African Americans and Asians and uh, Native American women were also given that right. And so we have a panel on uh, Bertha Brewer Ellis, who was a Johnson City woman who lived during the same time as the suffragists, but because of segregation and racial inequality, she did not participate. She wasn't allowed to participate in the organizations um, that a lot of the other women uh, participated in. And they named the girls club in Johnson City after her. So it was the first national um, girls club of its kind and it's named for her. So she's also uh, included in the mural in order to memorialize that part of the story. Um, and then we have some artifacts that um, showcase uh, the voting rights of people in the area. So we have a, the, one of the very first um, voting cards issued in East Tennessee in 1919 on display. It's a replica from the Tennessee State Museum. And then part of the exhibit over here is, uh, maybe around here, on the end there, are panels from the 75th anniversary. And one of the interesting things we found is that um, the women who participated in these events didn't really talk about it once they ended. So in their obituaries and things like that, um, there was no mention of it, but then um, later generations started to realize that it was a pretty big deal, you know, the things that they did. And the 75th anniversary is really where we start to see it being celebrated because until then, I think a lot of the, the women themselves, you know, the things that they were doing were acting outside of social norms and and they were pretty much leading a revolution in their day. And so that was perhaps not um, celebrated um, due to a lot of their social standing. I wonder if you have any questions or anything that you would like to know more about. Let's see, are the home ec patterns available? Well, I'm trying to get uh, a lot of this stuff online for you to be able to look at. So. Um, the pattern pieces are actual artifacts that are in the museum so that you can come in and you can make an appointment and come in and look at some things if you're interested in that. Um, and then I could try to get some photos. Okay, and can I read the banner? Okay, this banner right here says uh, Tennessee Equal Suffrage Campaign Committee. All right, can you see it there? I love the bluebirds. So they had a lot of symbolism, the yellow rose is one that everybody knows about. They also used bluebirds. Um, the white, yellow, purple combo was really um, important and meaningful and, and everybody made sure they had that on their person when they were demonstrating. Um, and this particular um, campaign committee was part of the organizational process that was happening here in East Tennessee. And in the middle of the gallery over here, I've got a little table set up and we have copies of the letters that were sent between these organizations and Eliza Shout White. Okay, let's see. Um, Alan Holmes asked if you could read the big banner by Mildred. Oh, that's the one I just did. Okay. <laughs> I wish I could hear you. <laughs> um, are there any parts of the local suffrage history that you would have liked to represent but weren't able to because of lack of research? Yes, and that is why I did a panel on Bertha Ellis because I feel like there should be a lot more information about the African American community at this time period. And I've interviewed and asked and looked and I have not been able to locate a lot of information. So. Um, if anybody knows anything and would like to help me with that, I would appreciate it. And, and I want to stress again that this is a community project. I really want this to feel representative of all parts of the community. So if you find that you know something that I left out, I would love to hear about that. Is there anything else you'd like to look at closer? I think I forgot to show you the sewing machine. Let me, let me take you over here because this sewing machine 
may have been used in the normal school home ec program. I am searching for documentation to prove that theory. But this is from the time period. And so I got very into um, the sewing aspect of this. My grandmother taught me to sew and she was an excellent seamstress. And it just seemed like such an important part of the story that these women were sewing these banners and making them, you know, that banner with the birds over there, all hand painted, it took forever, but that's exactly the way they would have done it, you know. Um, any books I would recommend or books I would really like? You know, I didn't really read a whole lot of books. I did a little bit of studying kind of of the national scene at first, but um, mostly what I have been reading are newspaper articles, and then I've been doing a lot of interviews and digging through archives of different sorts. So that's really where the information that I have came from. Anything else? I actually finished much quicker than I thought I would. Oh, the mural celebration. Okay. So, um, yeah, and the gallery is open. Part of the reason I don't want to go like too deep into anything is because I hope that you will come out and look at it and read the text panels and kind of get the information that you would like to have about it. Um, we are following CDC guidelines. We are being very uh, aware of the situation that we're in and we're limiting the number of visitors, but we are open Monday through Friday from 9 to 430 for visitors. So we, we do hope you'll come by and check out the exhibit. Um, I could not find records on numbers of women or particular women who, who were registered to vote um, to answer that question there. Um, so the mural um, is going to be installed at the corner of Ash and Ernest. Um, so if you're standing on West Walnut and looking down towards Summers Hardware, there's a blank wall right across the street from the old um, Ash Street Courthouse. And we love that connection because Lula Bell Milburn Devine, who was a leading suffragist, was also the first female postmistress appointed in Johnson City in 1922. And guess where she was postmistress at? Right there at the Ash County Post Office, because at first, or Ash Street Post Office, because that's what it was at first. So she'll be memorialized right there across the street from where she was appointed. Um, and that's going to happen, I think it's on October the 10th, and I know they're planning a big reveal and a big celebration, um, and there's a lot of people who are, are planning to participate in that. And, and it, it asks, am I going to be, but I'm not sure. I'm having a lot of social anxiety. I've been social distancing pretty carefully, so we shall see. <laughs> Let's see, okay, my own suffrage costume. Yes, I did make it myself. Um, it is a mixture, the outfit that I wear to the events is a mixture of store-bought and stuff that I make. So for example, I made um, Mildred Sash. So it's just painted. Now they would have used a lot of ribbon with their stencil. Um, and then um, I use a store-bought blouse because blouses are really difficult to make. And then just a black skirt and a big belt. And that's pretty much it. And a hat. And I wear my grandmother's hat when I wear that outfit. Um, young women. You know, I, don't, I have a teenage daughter and she's fairly blasé about it. So that's about the... <laughs> I don't know too much about that part, I guess. <laughs> um, I know that there were other people who were involved in this who were doing a lot of work with the Girl Scouts. Uh, members of the Harris family and also Bertha Brewer Ellis were Girl Scout leaders. So we were trying to get some major tie-ins with those organizations and then everything, you know, the, the pandemic hit and, and all of that was kind of put to the back burner. Okay, is there anything else I can tell you about? I really thought I would just talk all day, but... I don't know. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I 
I, I don't know any numbers on people who are registered to vote. So I know I know that question came in a minute ago too. The only the only thing I know is Eliza Shout White got one of the first voter registration cards for women in East Tennessee, and that was in 1919. But that's uh that's all. That's really all I know. We couldn't find any records that told us a you know a list of people or anything like that. I don't know that they kept records like that back then. Yeah, yes, I hope your students will come see it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to come back over here to the living room. And um, since, since I kind of finished a little early, maybe you would like to hear the gramophone play. So the gramophone is from 1910, and this is really before the radio. So the radio wasn't really around till kind of the 20s and early 30s. So this was the early stages of recorded technology. Before this, it would have just been live music. And can you see okay? Let me bring you closer. So of course, this is before um, everybody had electricity. So it's operated by a hand crank on the side. Now I've, I've done this a couple times. Let's see if I can get it to work. So crank it up. And then there's a lever in here where you move the needle. This is the Brandywine River. You picture like having some tea and relaxing. <laughs> Well, is, is there anything else that, that I can tell you about that you would like to hear? Okay, somebody's thinking about encounters between British suffragists and wondering about social stigma and punishments. Yeah, there was a lot of um, what could be described as torture, especially in um, Britain, but American women experienced it as well, but really in larger cities, as far as we've been able to tell, it was, it was not here so much. Um, and the term suffragette is kind of a loaded term, and I know that when people first hear about this time period, the only word they really know is suffragette. But that term was invented by a British journalist as a way to denigrate the women who are participating in the movement. And when you attach et onto the end of something in French, it diminishes it. So it was meant to sort of patronize the women. But the Pankhurst ladies took the word back and kind of turned it around to mean this kind of like bad feminist, you know, like the Joan of Arc warrior archetype that we were talking about earlier. And I mean, to me, it kind of reminds me of that word hillbilly. It's like if somebody else calls you that, you don't like it. But if you take it on and it becomes a, a meaningful word that empowers you, then um, it could be used in that way as well. So suffragette is kind of the same way. So throughout this exhibit, we have referred to the women as suffragists. <laughs> it is a really fun job. Somebody said I have the coolest job. I have to agree. It's a very fun job. This is my first big exhibit. It's the first big one I've put on yet. And I really, really enjoy doing it. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it really is a way to, to put all of my interests in one bag. So who else gets to say that about their work, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other, is, is there anything else you would like to know more about? I know as soon as I click the button, and this is over, I'll think of 500 things that I wish I would have said, so I'm trying to think of them right now. <laughs> well, I want to thank all of you for coming, and Rebecca, Thank you so much for um, sharing this incredible research and exhibit with us. 
uh, I want I put in the chat, but I just wanted to say um, openly that you can find the, a recording of Rebecca's presentation um, on the Women's Studies homepage. Give us a week or so to reformat it to YouTube, and then it will live on um, Women's Studies, and so you have access to it for your students and for yourself and for your friends. Um, there's also a great pop and doc um, series on suffrage on Thursday at 530. And so if you just look up pop and doc, Iron Jawed Angels and The Vote will be the two films that will be playing. And that's this Thursday at 530. So you can register for that if you would like more information. Um, but a, a round of applause for Rebecca and for all this amazing work. And we thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So we'll look forward to seeing you um, next uh, next uh, September, the first September, first Wednesday in September for our next um, lecture, which is uh, Deidre Rogers, Braving My Own Wilderness. So we'll look forward to seeing you first Wednesday in September. Thank you very much for coming.